All right. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Pediatric Grand Rounds. Thank you for joining us today. Today's speaker is Dr. Monica Garen Laflamme from the Department of Pediatric Gastroenterology. She's Associate Professor of Pediatrics at VTC SOM. Dr. Garen Laflamme received her training at University of Miami for her medical school and residency training. She went on to Cincinnati Children's Hospital for her Pediatric Gastroenterology Fellowship. She's joined Carillion since 2013 and heads up the pediatric IBD program. In addition to her clinical and educational roles, she lends her time to clinical research trials, QAQI projects, and serves as the co-director of the pediatric GI fellow elective here at Carillion for residents and students. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Monica Garin Laflamme. Thank you so much. Um, I'm so sorry I didn't send you my most recent CV because Dr. Cordell has just taken over for the uh, elective um, and he's doing a great job. So here we go. Hello all. I appreciate the opportunity to talk about pediatric inflammatory bowel disease during the COVID-19 pandemic and how we are working towards optimal therapy with improved care now. For objectives with today's talk, I want to review the current epidemiology of inflammatory bowel disease as well as the diagnostic IBD to explain what we currently know about IBD and COVID-19. Next, to introduce the goals of Improved Care Now, to review our current progress made by our program with participation in this quality care collaborative and discuss future goals with participation. Ooh, sorry guys, did it not move? Did the slide not move? Okay. Technical, did you all get to see that next slide? Is it moving now? So as pediatricians, we know a key point is that children are not little adults. And as such, this can present unique challenges. What is inflammatory bowel disease? It is a chronic intestinal disorder characterized by chronic inflammation of the intestinal tract. It's really an umbrella term used to encompass two main disorders, Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis. We usually know, uh, observe that it's a progressive damage to the intestinal tract. For pediatrics in particular, there can be unique risks for complications in growth, malnutrition, bone disease, and psychosocial issues. Pathogenesis is poorly defined, though we'll review current theories. And over the past century, studies have indicated that IBD is occurring more frequently in the United States. Now, several of these slides are adapted from previous NASPICAN teaching modules, and because it had been several years since it was created, I thought it was a good opportunity to review potential change in this data. On the whole, it can be difficult to be truly representative due to limited population-based studies. Some are conducted with small geographic areas, Wisconsin, California, for example. This is true of both pediatric and adult studies. Edward Loftus published key articles in the early 2000s that were based on studies from Olmsted, Minnesota. His 2016 update on the incidence and prevalence in adult IBD again pointed out that those county studies were not necessarily reflective of the United States as a whole. Kappelman sought to re-examine these results by using claims data from 12 million Americans over a set period of time. Together, Nearly 1.2 million persons in the United States have IBD. The prevalence is 100 to 200 children per 100,000 in the US. 5% of all persons in the US are of the pediatric population, and current, including a current estimate of 70,000 children with this diagnosis in the United States. I want to underscore that IBD is a pediatric concern. 25% of IBD patients will present before 20 years of age, 4% before age five years, which is thought to be a separate subset, and that acronym stands for Very Early Onset IBD. 18% will be diagnosed before 10 years, and peak onset is often seen during adolescence. Natural history. So childhood onset IBD is characterized by extensive intestinal involvement and rapid early progression. Pediatric Crohn's disease, as you see, often affects the colon with diffuse involvement, and there can be a common 
disease progression during the first decade after onset. Ulcerative colitis in the pediatric population often demonstrates extensive colitis affecting the entire colon versus the vast majority of adult presentation is localized to the left side. Lastly, time to colectomy with pediatric ulcerative colitis after initial diagnosis can be much sooner. So in summary, we argue that children fare worse. <clears throat> All right, momentary break. I want to step back and I want this to be a comprehensive grand rounds, but this means keeping everybody's attention. I can't see you. Um, so I'm adding slides for mini breaks um, and trying to think of this. I was pondering the vacations that none of us are taking this year because of the pandemic. So it brought me back to our family adventures. We often went to Scotland to see castles and many of these have been featured in movies. So here we go. You're gonna get the gist. This is pronounced Dune Castle. I'll be testing our knowledge of TV movie series featured castles. And I have the chat open. So does anybody know an ancient movie popularized by Dune Castle? So you probably mentally know. There we go. Yes, it's Monty Python and the Holy Grail. But honestly, it was a bit humbling because this was 1979, and I know all of our residents were not even born then. So can anybody name a more modern series that featured this castle? Namely, the Game of Thrones. And this was featured um, with the castle when we saw it a second time. This castle, ca uh, castle was the site for Winterfell. So hopefully I'll get the idea of these mini bricks. Now, there aren't as many as I initially planned because we ended up with a 90 minute talk. I either have a 30 minute talk or a 90 minute talk. So I'm gonna try and split the difference. Back to IBD. Clinical and basic research suggests that there are three factors critically important in the development of inflammatory bowel disease in any given individual. First, patients have to inherit the genes that predispose to inflammatory bowel disease Presently, there are over 160 known genes that increase the development of IBD. These genes may result in abnormalities to the mucosal immune system, such as overproduction of pro-inflammatory cytokines or underproduction of anti-inflammatory cytokines. Finally, there must be a triggering event to occur to set in motion this chronic inflammation. It's generally thought to be bacteria, changes in the microbiome, infection, use of antibiotics, and can also include other environmental factors such as smoking and NSAIDs. I like this looking at a bit more expanded with genetics, Crohn's disease in particular is common among the Ashkenazi Jewish population. Nod 2 mutation or altered expression has been found to, in patients with Crohn's disease. Um, I like this because it showed a little more detail for the microbiome. I will not attempt to pronounce any of them, but simply put, the upper part are those that increase the risk and the lower those that reduce or seem less commonly. IBD involving the colon, whether ulcerative colitis or Crohn's disease, most commonly presents with diarrhea and rectal bleeding. In contrast, Crohn's disease involving the terminal ileum tends to present much more subtly with abdominal pain, weight loss, fatigue, fever, although that's not too subtle. It can be growth, delay, or failure alone. And it can, if we think diarrhea, diarrhea, IBD, we're going to miss it because a lot of those children actually have constipation. These two diagnoses have both overlapping but also distinct clinical and pathologic features. It's often important to determine as best we can what type of IBD this is as it can affect optimal treatment therapy. Differentiating Crohn's disease from ulcerative colitis can be difficult, especially if IBD is limited to the colon. So this is what I always suggest residents kind of memorize because they're always on the boards. Crohn's disease discontinuous. If you don't have rectal disease, you cannot by definition have ulcerative colitis, et cetera. This slide illustrates intestinal manifestations of IBD and are divided into the different organ systems that can be affected. Extra intestinal manifestations such as arthritis are seen both in Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis, but interestingly are a presenting feature in less than 15% of the time. 
Another one I like to point out is erythema nodosum because it can often be mistaken for bruising over the shins, but it's raised and it will parallel the course of intestinal symptoms. Delving a little more into arthritis, they're noted in, of course, in patients who have IBD, but there are two forms. The peripheral form commonly affects larger joints, knees, ankles, wrists, elbows, and it's usually related to active colonic disease. The axial form or ankylosing spondylitis, sacroiliitis, is very rare in children, but in contrast, central axial arthritis does not follow the course of intestinal disease. And looking at this list, reviewing it, the main, mainly axial arthritis and sclerosing cholangitis does not follow clinical course of IBD. Regarding differences in serology, I'll let you read the serology section. Looking at gross appearance, we need to know what is normal. Look at the top upper left-hand corner. That's normal. You can see the sharp haustral and haustral folds. You can see the blood vessels easily. I often with endoscopy say, this is a beautiful colon. Um, so I'm destined to be GI. In contrast, the middle slide is of ulcerative colitis. Uh, it's often described as granular in appearance. Think of, I tell the residents, you know, sprinkling brown sugar all over the colon. It has that kind of look. Crohn's disease, right next to that slide, illustrates in this picture, it can have deep serpiginous ulcerations, but also it can have small aphthous ulcers. Um, to the far right at the top, that's a picture of a normal ileum in contrast to um, the, I can't point it out with a pointer, I'm sorry, it's covered, but you can see a deep ulceration and erythema, and I promise if you touch that tissue, it would bleed, very friable. <clears throat> so how do we treat? Aminocillus late or 5 ASAs work by blocking the activity of cyclooxygenase and lipooxygenase to reduce the production of prostaglandins and lipotrienes by preventing leukocyte recruitment into the bowel wall and also vasodilation. This can lead to inflammation. Antibiotics in particular can be helpful for Crohn's-related perianal disease, abscesses, post-operative recurrence, and they decrease inflammation by eliminating or changing bacteria in the gut. Immunomodulators suppress the immune system that triggers intestinal damage. <clears throat> the reason why we like these in particular is they are small pills, daily dosing, in contrast to 5-ASAs that can take multiple pills multiple times a day. But in contrast, it can take three to four months for maximal efficacy. Pro-inflammatory cytokines, like we talked before, contribute to IBD inflammation. TNF-alpha, for example, which is a well-known pro-inflammatory cytokine is elevated in IBD patients. And so the next category of biologics aim to block and neutralize these cytokines and thereby reduce the inflammatory process. Steroids to suppress inflammation, they're anti-inflammatory medications, they relieve symptoms. Um, so it can be very much, very much helpful. However, they do not promote GI tract mucosal hearing I mean, healing, sorry, and as such are not indicated for maintenance therapy. I wanted to focus a little more on biologics because those are being used more and more in the pediatric sphere. And Fleximab is an anti-TNF antibody first showing its clinical efficacy in 1997. It's a chimeric monoclonal antibody. And the setup is it's an IV infusion, weight-based dosing starting with five mix per kg. Induction is time zero, two, and six weeks, and thereafter every eight weeks. Adalimumab is a human anti, I mean, human IgG monoclonal anti-TNF antibody, and in contrast, it's a sub-Q injection every two weeks at fixed doses, two, depending on weight. And those two are the only currently that are FDA approved for pediatrics. Vitalizumab that you can see to the right is an anti integrin humanized monoclonal antibody that blocks the alpha-4, beta-7, which is found primarily on cells localizing to the GI tract. So it was the first biologic designed exclusively for IBD. And the most recent class of biologics that I think all three of us have used and our patients um, are include the anti-IL-1223 class that inhibits the shared P40 subunit used to kinemab, which I highlighted to the left, is one of those examples. It is administered via a fixed 
dose every eight weeks after initial weight-based IV infusion that is so difficult to get PA for, but we do it. Um, and of note, the therapeutic benefit of ustekinumab is now believed primarily to be IL-23 rather than IL-12 blockade. <clears throat> All right, our goal is for our patients is to achieve clinical remission, but what tools can be used to systematically reflect this? First, I want to show you the pediatric ulcerative colitis activity index. As you can see, based on symptoms, you give a score, um, and then that gives you a total number. Greater than 65 is felt to be severe disease. If you have a change of 20 points, that defines as a response. So that's for ulcerative colitis. For pediatric, for Crohn's disease, it's the PCDAI. That too has symptoms, but also combines lab work, hematocrit, yes, um, sed rate, albumin, and weight changes, um, given a maximum score of 100. But if you have greater than 30, that's felt to be moderate to severe disease. And then those two are tools that are, we use for Improved Care Now to gauge clinical remission or severity, or, or, but we also use the physician global assessment. I will not go into specific detail, but we use the clinical history we obtained with the visit and the other data we get surrounding the visit to determine our global assessment. That you see in active disease, mild disease, and then you see moderate or severe. And what's interesting is with our last iteration, we have to point out persistent th symptoms thought to be due to IBD because a lot of times we were saying that our patients were not in clinical remission because they had IBS symptoms and they had abdominal pain. So it allows us to kind of distinguish between the two. All right, that was a doozy. So I'm sorry for, I showed you, I showed myself that slide, the second slide, but not, not all of you, I apologize. So little break, this is not really a castle. Chatsworth House is located in Derbyshire, England. Um, it was in the movie, I think you all, all know, Pemberley is a fictional country estate owned by Mr. Darcy and Pride and Prejudice. So you can see Chatsworth House in the background. All right, enter COVID-19. Coronavirus disease 2019 or COVID-19 is caused by the zoonotic coronavirus SARS-CoV-2 with known cases starting in December of 2019. While it is predominantly spread by airborne droplets, there is also viral shedding in the stool, giving the potential for fecal oral transmission and of that of importance when considering endoscopic procedures. The acronym SECURE IBD stands for Surveillance Epidemiology of Coronavirus Under Research Exclusion. It's an international pediatric and adult registry to monitor and report on outcomes of COVID-19 occurring in IBD patients. It contains only de-identified data. This information from Brenner et al. is from August of this year, and this map illustrates the cases of COVID-19 among patients reported to this database. So currently in the age groups we care for, there has not been any reported mortality for our pediatric IBD population. One of the main takeaways underscored by the title of this article is that currently corticosteroids, but not anti-TNF, um, not TNF antagonists are associated with adverse COVID-19 outcomes in patients with IBD. All these efforts have led to current guidelines, the above being as of July. This is for the adult recommendations. They encourage patients with IBD to continue their medications, and they promote that IBD does not at this time appear to increase the risk of SARS-CoV infection or the development of COVID-19. Recommendations for IBD patients who develop COVID-19 fever, respiratory symptoms, digestive symptoms, et cetera, namely to stop immune modulator medications, biologic therapies with a plan of restarting therapy after complete resolution of COVID-19 symptoms. And of course, as always, to contact your doctor before stopping any medications. These guidelines are from their European counterparts, Secure IBD, and I'll let you read along as I um, talk, but essentially recommending to continue to focus on our 
known safety measures of good hand hygiene, avoiding contact with anybody with respiratory symptoms, social distancing, and I think now we would all add mask wearing. When possible, to continue follow up visits, ensuring monitoring of disease, <clears throat> telemedicine with the use of surrogate markers, blood work, and stool testing, et cetera. For me personally, especially when we first started telemedicine, I felt if I did not feel comfortable enough to have our patients come to clinic, I equally did not want them to go to the lab unless it was absolutely essential. All right, so in sum total, this is the review of IBD and the current guidelines during the COVID-19 pandemic. So now we can test how all of you were actively absorbing all this knowledge. And I confess, I haven't been able to figure out the chat screen. So I'm gonna assume that you're all responding. Question one, which of the following most accurately reflects the epidemiologic features of inflammatory bowel disease? A, the prevalence is approximately 100 cases per 100,000 in the general population. B, the prevalence is approximately 1,000 1, cases per 100,000 in the general population. C, non-Jews are more likely to develop Crohn's disease than Jews. D, people who smoke are less likely to get Crohn's disease. E, people who smoke are more likely to get Crohn's disease. And the answer is A, there's a negative correlation between smoking and UC, not to the point that we recommend use of course, and a positive correlation between smoking and Crohn's disease. The people of, although I, I must mention, I did not point that out, I'm not sure. People of Jewish descent have a higher risk of developing Crohn's disease compared to non-Jews, highlighting the partly genetic etiology of this disease. All right. Next one, did we did cover the reverse, which I always, don't pick up which of the following is not true about pediatric versus adult IBD. A, with pediatric Crohn's disease, the colon is most affected by and has diffuse involvement being common. B, with adults, disease extension is less common during the first decade of the disease after onset. C, the vast majority of pediatric patients with ulcerative colitis have left-sided colitis. D, time to colectomy after initial diagnosis is quicker in pediatric ulcerative colitis. E, none of the above. So the correct answer is C. For pediatric ulcerative colitis, extensive colitis involving the entire colon or pancolitis is very common versus more of an adult phenotype includes left-sided colitis. All right, last question. Which of the following extraintestinal manifestations of inflammatory bowel disease does not parallel the course of intestinal inflammation and does not improve in parallel with improvement in intestinal symptoms? A, peripheral arthritis, B, aphthous ulcers, C, spondylitis and sacroiliitis, D, erythema nodosum, E, uveitis and iritis. Oh, yay, Joe Tomez is getting them all right. <laughs> um, the answer is C, peripheral arthritis usually involves large joints. It does not cause synovial destruction and parallels the course of intestinal symptoms. As a reminder, central axial arthritis, such as ankylosing spondylitis, is similar to sclerosing cholangitis in that it does not follow the course of intestinal disease. Okay, so now on to improve care now. This part of the talk will focus on the interim improvements made over this past year. Improve Care Now, or ICN, is a collaborative network of pediatric GI practices whose goal is to improve the care and outcomes of the children with Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis. When our program first entered, there were 73 centers, 20,000 IBD patients, including 600 pediatric GI providers. Now, as you can see, um, these are the most recent stats as of July of this year. There are more than 100 centers, almost 1,000 pediatric GI providers caring for more than 30,000 children with IBD. Just in contrast, I mean, our center is a smaller center. We take care of more or less with 150 patients um, in our program. All right. So results of these QI measures seen with this slide reflect only centers with greater than 75% enrollment, so as not to skew with centers that have just joined. Initial involvement did help our program to improve the care we provided our patients. We were able to more objectively understand our population. For example, we could say, we believe most of our IBD patients are doing well, to we know that this percentage of our patients are actually doing well. 
I would be remiss not to say that Mike Hart's approaching of an ultimate retirement did not or definitely had its ripple effects. I mean, we all know his great enthusiasm viewed to all of us. It was infectious, finally, in a good way. Um, and given how there can always be competing demands, this led to participation being less of a priority than it should have been. And that was my failing. And consequently, our ICN involvement was not where it should have been. And our QI measures reflected this. Our goal then was how do we make this better? Any QI approach follows with the first three questions. Number one, what are we trying to accomplish? Number two, how will we know that a change is an improvement? Number three, what changes will we make that will result in improvement? The, these questions are linked through the following four small cycles of change, planning the change to be tested, implementing the change, comparing the situation before and after, reflecting on what was learned, and lastly, acting on the information and planning the next PDSA cycle, essentially deciding what to keep and what to further work on. First, we needed to plan what to prioritize and how to begin. Our center with the most recent ICN conference began working with other centers and chose to focus on population management to improve our QI measures. And in summary, those centers doing well, because we spoke to everybody, not just PIs, stressed the following. Number one, in particular, to increase the percentage of patients seen every six months. Findings were that even if doing clinically well, Twice yearly visits allow to reevaluate the degree of remission and determine if we need to reconsider medical therapy, making sure treatment dosing is appropriate, et cetera. Example, again, unique to pediatrics is we want and expect our patients to grow and gain weight. And as many of our medications are weight based, lack of timely follow up can jeopardize optimal dosing. Um, and this too was of increased importance given my CART's retirement to make sure that his patients were appropriately resigned and then not lost to follow up. Number two, making sure providers have the tools with every visit to give a roadmap and reminders for each patient on what should be considered and prioritized. And then lastly, to optimize data quality. We needed to be confident that we could rely on the information from QI measures, the idea of good data in, in order for good data out. So after the ICM conference felt moving, improving these three areas would improve our QI measures and have the most impact on optimizing our clinical care. So for the data quality, I'm not going to go through those individually because you'll see them with the following slides. All right, I have to first from the outset mention that everybody in our GI group really worked to make this possible, even if many attempts didn't work out. Um, but that's the whole thing about PDSA. So after brainstorming, we agreed to divide our patients based on residents, the ones that were from Mike. And quite frankly, he had already done a great job anticipating and reassigning almost all of his patients. I took the current list of the ICN registry patients and organized them by date of enrollment, divided them by the new provider and alphabetized, and then updated um, this and it, that's now contained on the OneDrive. Kelly has ownership for making adjustments, but we needed a reliable system to notify changes, patients added, patients um, graduated to adult care, et cetera. And this is when Gail stepped in. She now updates Kelly when new patients are enrolled. Next, I documented when the patient was last seen, each patient, and if there was a current plan in place for follow-up. By doing that, I was able to take a step back and identify discrepancy with plans of follow-up. And so it was an opportunity to regroup and talk to each other about why it's good to have visits every six months. And it was a culture change that um, has really helped to kind of reinforce this QI goal. Um, by creating a provider patient list, I started to send charts to uh, Jenny and Shannon on patients that were overdue to make follow-up appointments. And Gail again has taken ownership for checking this provider patient list to identify who might have fallen off um, and send back to the front desk to set up follow up. Given that our calendar schedule now is expanded from two to six months, it also allows for follow up appointments to be made on the same day if clinically doing well and less chance that families will fall off the radar, or fall off their radar. This was pre COVID, but I will still have to underscore that Jenny and Shannon are doing an amazing job of keeping up on that. Because with COVID, we, they don't go back to the front desk. 
Ooh, sorry, guys. All right, so this illustrates that we have improved from only 74% of our patients to now 88% of our patients consistently being seen every six months. Um, and just to kind of orient all the slides, we'll show the network target on top, our goal from where we were to where we wanted to go, and then the blue line is our group, the green line is the network goal, and the dotted red line is the uh, IBD consortium, the IBD averaged, and it's supposed to be greater than 75% cohort. Before our re-examination, the plan was for each provider to look up the registry. So this is focusing on the tools, this pre-visit planning report. They were going to look up their patient's PVP form, and it would happen before every visit. And with re re review, only two of the four providers had access to the registry. I discussed with other centers who conveyed that this was not a realistic expectation. So I went to the ICM help desk. I got access for all the providers. I got access for all the nurses. The first thought was with a nurse provider pair, the nurse would review the list for the following week, go to the registry, print out the PVP form. Needless to say, this was crash and burn. There were just way too many steps. It was too cumbersome. And essentially, it wasn't intuitive on how to create the PDF form. And most importantly, our nurses didn't have the time. I mean, we are all busy and that was just going to be the camel, the, the straw that broke the camel's back. So what we did was we needed to identify, and this is a small thing, but who are our ICM patients? How do we make it simple? So in Epic now, in the comment section, each of our patient with uh, an ICN has the phrase ICN patient. So, Again, Gail and Kelly makes this possible. Midweek, Gail will review the next week's patients looking for the phrase ICM patient. She sends the list to Kelly, who sends the PDF form to the individual providers uh, by the end of the week. So I keep on talking about the PVP form. Let's take a look at it. This is not, I mean, didn't wanna have four pages, but this is just kind of an illustration at the top. I have blocked off the ICM number and the provider. But you can see that left the diagnosis, the date of diagnosis, the extent of disease, perianal phenotype or not, the last visit, the growth and weight parameters, and then longitudinally, you can see the series of visits. Um, remember, I talked about data quality. One of them is to get our information into the chart within 30 days. And this definitely was done, but I was too eager to make this slide. And this was way, way, way ahead of time before Kelly had any time to enter anything. So that's why I put the results on the side. Um, so what did this do? These are the QI measures related to these two main um, changes that were affected. To the left, you have the network target. To the right, again, you have the average of the cohorts with greater than 75% enrollment. For patients with clinical remission, we wanted to increase from 77% to 83%, and now we're close to 89%. Patients not taking prednisone from 87%, now we're almost, most, almost all of our patients are not currently on prednisone. A nuance is how many of our patients have prednisone-free clinical remission, and that's closer to 89% from 69 Dose of thiopurine being appropriate, that's one foul. And I was reviewing, there were two reasons for that. Number one, there is a patient that's in there that's a glitch. The patient's on Remicade, and <clears throat> we don't use that uh, to be average because a lot of us, if we're adding combination therapy, oh, it could be combination therapy, but it could also be that we're using the immunomodulator to reduce antibody formation. And so inherently, it's going to be a much lower. Um, and Fliximab, we're doing well there with dosing methotrexate. We often have a very small percentage of our patients um, with this. So only one measure can totally mess this up. Um, so much so that I think they're going to remove it, although we're still going to continue to track. Oh, 
Interestingly enough, I wanted to point out for the thyropurine dosing, one of the patients, the dose is supposed to be two mg per kg per day for Imuran, child's at 1.94, because even though had normal TPMT activity, which is how you're supposed to metabolize this medication, had toxic effects when they were in that range, but doing clinically well. So this is just an illustration. This is a tool, but we're treating our patients, not the QI measure, okay? And our patients are doing on the whole very well for their nutrition and growth. All right, that was a lot. So Laycock Abbey, this uh, Abbey was featured in two movies of this very long series of seven. And I think you all probably know this was Harry Potter. So still love the movie. All right. Next, how do we improve data quality? We learned from the ICN conference that most institutions make observable change, had to be willing to increase the review of the exceptions report from monthly to weekly. So our brainstorm and Kelly, with Kelly and we agreed that this is what we needed to tackle. I identified the best way to communicate with my colleagues, be it Epic or email, email was the one that won. And so what we do is we now do a weekly exception report. It's the wall of fame or shame um, because we're all included. Um, and it illustrates that we're all human. I'm on that list several times too. So um, I used a snipping tool to kind of make it easier for us to visualize, okay, where is the error if there's kind of something that doesn't match? So it's not as onerous to correct um, if there's data not entered or data that doesn't seem to jive with the previous. Um, so I started with weekly exception reports, sorry. Um, and the plan was for us to correct it within a week. There was definitely a learning curve, but the squeaky wheel gets the grease and now it's a priority. So um, what initially what we were deciding was when we sent, we included pre, before there was a lot of buy-in, we included previous and corrected data. And then the decision was after two weeks, if it wasn't corrected, I would try and see if I could do it on my own. And if not, I would bring it to the intention of each provider. Um, but again, with time, there was a lot of provider buy-in and Kelly um, offered, I'm not techie techie, so she offered to review the exception reports and send them weekly. The outcome pre-COVID was multiple months without anything to report. And why do I say pre-COVID uh, is because we did for at the height of, of the pandemic and all of the changes, or, well, the changes we were making for the pandemic, I should say, not the height of it, um, we did have to bring that out for a couple of weeks at a time. All right, so this is the percentage of visits with a complete bundle. We wanted to go from 69% to 79%, and we're hanging out about 82%, which is on par with ICN group at large. And I think this is not bad considering part of this complete bundle includes height, weight, BMI being plotted. And if we're doing telemedicine and that's the priority um, at the time, we're not gonna get that data. Do, do, do percentage of all critical data recorded. Um, so the network target is 95%. We wanted to go from 62 to 95%. We're at 94. Um, I know it was a little ambitious. Uh, again, if you can't enter data like height, you can't have it be complete. So I think this is very reasonable for now. And lastly, percentage of patients in the practice that are registered and not deactivated with a visit recorded in the last 13 months. I think this is a very good measure. It's essentially a way of gauging that the center's data is reflective of enrolled patients. For example, when I went to the conference, there was discussion that a lot of centers, if a patient was lost to follow up, they just couldn't get them back, they would deactivate them, as then the stats were not rolled into the QI measures. But then you're skewing the results. So I'm, I'm happy that at least what we're doing is reflective of our patient population. So, all right, mental break. <laughs> Dover Castle, I confess I haven't been there. I want to see the White Cliffs of Dover. Um, the series that featured this castle was The Clocks. So Hercule Poirot, I'm obsessed with all things Agatha Christie. This is a bit dated. The Clocks was 2009. So there is a more recent series that 
many of you might have seen, and that would be the crown. All right, we're getting to the end of the data. <laughs> to improve, in order to improve kind of buy-in, I needed to improve the morale. I needed to make this less of an enforced mandate. I had to make it, especially again, with transition from patients that weren't ours, you know disease extent inherently if you've been following a child since they were initially diagnosed. But I needed to make completion of the SMART form easier because that delay was causing delay in visits being entered within 30 days of the, of the appointment. So um, I needed to have a way to clearly for all of us to clearly know the information, the type of information that doesn't change. Um, the smart form, there's a big cover so in general, there are 30 plus boxes to fill out. Um, part of it is easy, um, but the one the issue that doesn't change, if we're having to go back and look through the disease location, that slows you down. Um, and then that can lead to inaccurate uh, information. So this is my one shout out to Epic upgrade. The blue sticky that we always see to the left, that is the um, link to the specialty comment section. Before we were thinking of filling that out, um, well, we do that for a lot of our chronic patients that have G-tubes, et cetera, but you have to go to the summary page and then scroll all the way down. So this, when you type it in, everybody sees it. So, all right, just to understand what we're talking about, this is just an example. This part is easy because we're filling it out in real time. This is the section that was slowing everybody down. And these are the things that don't change. But for example, you cannot go if you with inflammation, you start with inflammatory disease, you can progress to fistulizing or stricturing, but you never go back. You have stricturing disease. Hopefully we have addressed that, but you have the the phenotype of structuring disease. So the way I went about addressing this was dot phrases. I did dot phrases within the specialty comments, um, as well as for the medications, because we that's one of the things that you need to enter manually um, to make it a lot easier. Um, so the idea was uh, to allow for the for Kelly to review the information if it's not filled out in the specialty comments. But the other thing that we did together was to see precisely what she was doing. And she never complained that she was entering a lot of the data manually, which the whole purpose of the smart form is that it's electronically transferred to the registry. So we realized in discussion that our smart form was antiquated. And so, talk to the IT and ICN and RTSG to kind of update that. Of course, had to be patient because this was around the time of the first big epic upgrade, So, but it got done. So with that, putting it all together, um, improved this quality measure as well. I mean, I can say Kelly was doing an amazing job because she was still at 92%, but these changes have allowed the information to be entered timely and accurately. All right. I think only a couple more castles, Dune Revisited. I thought this is more modern day. Yes, the Age of Ultron, which I have not seen. So now all of this is important, but in particular, we chose our current ICN Learning Lab specifically to optimize population management. So our next goal was to get on board with reviewing our patients based on disease severity, to try and brainstorm on ways to optimize care. This is still a priority, but we've had to put it on the back burner a little bit. So now that things are getting back to full staff, we're going to pull these back. So I chose to focus on patient population with mild disease severity. What we do is we look by disease severity in order to kind of give guidance on what could we consider adding or changing. Um, I started with my patients. It was a very good exercise. It, it kind of made us think about things we should anticipate, but we realized that it would be much more cumbersome if the patient wasn't known to the provider. A lot of institutions, the research coordinator is, is leading this discussion, but again, I think that's not good time management. 
So what we eventually want to do is to tack on at the end of ops, I think it better at the end of ops meeting to review one patient. So we keep things in check. Okay. So our 2020 annual aims were to increase the percentage of restable, registrable population from 63 to 80%. Right now we are at 82% to increase the rate of patients with clinical remission from 85 to 90%, we're at 89. Maintain the percentage of patients prednisone free clinical remission above 80%, we're 89. Um, increase the percentage of patients with sustained clinical remission from 42 to 60%. Um, and 60% is the target goal network. Um, we're at 56%. I didn't focus on that too, too much because there's a lot more that goes into that. And we also wanted, I was really excited about the fact this past year that subspecial clinics could offer the flu vaccine. So I wanted to start a flu vaccine a QI project to increase the rates of vaccination in our IBD population. Okay. We're nearing the home stretch. Aylan Dunan, um, I was clearly pronouncing it wrong, was featured in a 1999. Uh, why am I blanking? Um, the world is not enough. Uh, gosh, why? We we all know James Bond. There we go. Um, it was supposed to be the Scottish headquarters of MI6. All right, future goals. What I want to do is. Um, when we think of ICN, the, the phrase that's always used is share seamlessly, steal shamelessly. And I was very impressed that one of the programs has been able to incorporate depression screening in the pediatric population. I think it's so important. Um, we know that adolescence is a period of physical and psychological development. It's turmoil, I think we all remember it. For those of you that can't see the webinar, there's a far side cartoon where you've got a T-Rex tripping over a rock, you've got a pterodactyl hitting into a tree and a very awkward looking Neanderthal. Um, so hope that's right. Um, and the quote is, although it lasted only 2 million years, the awkward age was considered a hazardous time for most species. We all know it's a difficult, a rough time. But adolescents who have IBD may be particularly um, stressed and have a difficult time because of growth and pubertal delay, body image, if you have prolonged uh, exposure to steroids, you can have cushionoid features, and acne, and then just the social invalidism from just the constant abdominal pain and diarrhea when not under well control. So what we know, um, and Kelly Henschel gave a great talk, I remember, about the need for depression screening. By age 18, one in five adolescents will have a major depressive episode. 75% of adolescents go unrecognized, and a third of them uh, only a third of them get treatment. It can lead to suicide, we know, and untreated. It can, I mean, relate to all of these ill effects. I, mean, I can't even imagine caring for a, a child with IBD that could be pregnant. I mean, the, the complications that can come from that are wide. And Mechner um, illustrated that youth with IBD are at increased risk for depression. I mean, just being here, I've seen several of my patients. I mean, when you're eight and you're told to take this medicine every day, it's not a problem. But when you're 15, you start saying, why am I different? Why do, why do I feel tired? Especially if they stop taking their medicines because they don't want to be different and it can spiral. So my goal is not only to have the ability to do the depression screening, but what do we do? Like we need to have an algorithm, a next step. And that's why I'm amazed that one of the ICN programs is doing just that. It's it by having these kind of scripts and scenarios, you know how to be more comfortable talking about results of the depression screening, and then what to do if you um, if the depression screening indicates that somebody needs help, and how not to have that completely disrupt the clinic. So my thought was, it needed to be a, a, a big multi-step plan. Well, our to achieve this big goal, it needed to be a multi-step plan. My idea was to first develop experience and credibility with this QI IBD vaccination study, and then working towards increased participation with clinical studies to help support um, these endeavors. All right, so why is it important? I think these are key points. Your response to vaccines are not significantly lower if you do or you don't have IBD in pediatrics. 
And then even between the kids that have IBD that are on immunosuppressive therapy, the um, immune response is not significantly lower. So uh, my, I, um, I want to also say Ryan Fulton helped uh, to navigate because this was new to me. Um, and and that's that's kind of one of his goals to kind of get us all doing more QI projects. Um, basically, because of the recent changes in access, I think it's a unique opportunity to offer the influenza vaccine at the time of GI follow up. And my proposal, our specific aim was to increase flu vaccination by 25%. The, one of the, um, the last slide, the article that was referenced in one program, they documented that just the ability to have the flu vaccination markedly increased um, receiving the, the flu vaccination. One thing we did not expect um, was COVID. Uh, and so while well, we just got the red cap, so if there were any interested medical students or residents, would love to have you on board. Um, it may be a two year process because the concern with COVID-19 is that if you don't want to come to clinic, if you're focusing more on telemedicine, which is good, you're not going to have the opportunities for vaccination. All right, home stretch. Um, this is, I think, the last castle, blackness. This is, we look like little ants. Um, and this, I'm going to show you the exact scene. This is the last movie trivia slide. So yes, Outlander. I'm behind, but that's okay. <laughs> I, so, all right. Lastly, uh, we're going to be involved in an upcoming QI project um, through Children's National Hospital. Uh, Melissa Shapiro is going to be the PI. And basically, the title is Investigating Evaluation and Prescribing Practices for Newly Diagnosed IBD Patients During COVID-19. Their aim is to investigate whether providers are deviating from the standard practice of care for new patients with IBD in light of the COVID pandemic. I hope that that isn't the case, but we shall see. And with that, any questions? Of note, this castle in the background, do not know what movie, if any movie, is associated, but it's pronounced Kulain. It's T-U-L-Z-E-A-N, which, go figure. All right, thank you all for your attention, and I'm happy to take any questions. And of course, the slide set will have the references. Why do you think more children are being diagnosed with IBD? Um, so, great question. Um, you know, sometimes we talk, for example, celiac disease, you know, we argue sometimes that it's not that it's increasing, it's just that we're recognizing it more often. Um, I think it gets to, and and I didn't show this slide for the sake of boop, 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 not making this to our lecture, but um, they had some kind of global slides. So it's not just pediatric global slides from the 1930s comparing to how they've progressed. So um, the thought is, you know, you always have the idea of the hygiene hypothesis. And if we're having more antibiotics and less exposure, maybe that's, you know, allowing that kind of microbiome to be unchecked. Um, latitude as well. Um, when I was at Dartmouth, I saw a lot more patients with IBD. So one of the things as well, um, I think we're all understanding the importance of not having our patients with low vitamin D, but in particular, uh, good vitamin D levels are thought to be protective against the inflammatory cascade. Um, so I think that all comes together and we're not unique in IBD to be seeing an increased um, incidence. Mm -hmm. Great question. Let's see. So from Dr. Tomez or Joe Tomez, during the QI project, what did you find was most prominent factor which might have impaired data collection and sharing among providers in the ICN process? Do you mean within our program at large? Well, I live, you know, eat, breathe IBD. And so I think everybody's going to do the same. And I think with any QI project, we need to be realistic and we need to make it doable. 
I'm not going to say easy. We need to make it doable. And I just don't think as the PI, I was cognizant of that. I wasn't, I don't think I was listening to that. And so I think, I mean, to a certain extent, I let us all down, but I think this was a very good learning opportunity. And hopefully Juan and Rick would agree that the process of kind of getting the data in is a lot easier now. Well, thanks for the questions. <laughs>